have expressed that homelessness is their number one issue and they want us to address this issue. 64% um, of those same people said, but they'd rather live in San Francisco than any place else in the world. And what that says is there is hope. There is hope for the future. If we make the right investments, if we work together, and yes, we're gonna have our ups and downs, we're gonna have our fights, we're gonna have our struggles. We know our small businesses are experiencing challenges and we have to make sure that we invest more and we cut back on fees and bureaucracy for those small businesses. There are so many incredible things that I know we're gonna be able to do to eventually get our city to a better place. And I am counting on so many folks in this room. We have a large number of department heads who are here to listen. Um, we have a supervisor from District 8, Supervisor Raphael Mandelman, and Supervisor Valley Brown from District 5. <laughs> and, and I gotta say, as someone who came from the community and started working in City Hall, I was always frustrated with the disconnect between what was happening in City Hall and what was actually happening in the community. And we would pass laws, we would make decisions, and then I would try and go to one of my favorite restaurants, Shiva Lounge or Eddie's Cafe, and I'd get an earful from my constituents about how this is negatively impacting their lives. I don't want us to continue to be a city that just decides on policy in a bubble with just a few people. I want us to bring our conversation to the community so that we hear from you directly. Whether it's emails, whether it's town halls, or what have you, we're gonna be hosting office hours all over the city. We need to make policy, or remove policies, based on your feedback, based on your challenges. I want San Francisco to be a better place for all of us. I want us to get there. And part of getting there is making the hard decisions. Whether it's policy, whether it's investment, um, what have you, we have, we know a lot to do, but I'm excited about the future and looking forward to hearing from you here tonight on things that you want to see us do uh, so that we can make it better. And I also, I mean, wow, the whole departments, all the departments here. We got the chief of police, we got our new director of public health, got our housing folks, the DPW. And yes, MTA is here, but I know we have some challenges, Mr. Riskin, but we're gonna be nice tonight. <laughs> um, so tonight is about you know, expressing ourselves, and yes, we know there are complaints, and um, we know that there are challenges. We're here to listen. Um, that's really the point of, of this town hall. And with that, um, so that I'm not going on, am I turning it over to you, Claire, or supervisor? Okay. So I'm going to turn it over um, to Supervisor uh, Mandelman for a few remarks, and then Supervisor Valley Brown, um, and then we're going to start opening up the conversation. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to be super brief because um, you are here to hear from uh, these amazing constituents, but I do want to thank you, Mayor Reed, for coming out to the community, being here, and uh, allowing people the opportunity to talk directly with you and this amazing gathering of the top leadership from City Hall um, about the challenges facing San Francisco. We have great conversations inside the building, but I think it is useful to come out and give people the opportunity to actually express what's on their mind. So thank you very, very much for doing that. And I also do want to, if Rebecca Walt is still in the room, are you still, uh, there you are. I just want to um, thank you, Rebecca, for uh, hosting us today and also for your extraordinary work all these many years in the center. I remember not so long ago that we were not sure that this building was even going to be able to keep its doors open. And now uh, the doors are open, the building is completely remodeled, the, um, the, the finances make sense, and, you, and what, you know, many folks are coming to me asking for help. But, um, but happily, the center is, is not one of them anymore. Um, so the center is definitely a success story, and that is largely um, to your leadership. So thank you, Rebecca Rolf. And and with that, I'll get out of the way and allow uh, Supervisor Brown to say a few words. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Mayor Bree, for bringing us all together. Uh, thank you to the center, Rebecca. I think uh, even though this is in District 8, I catch you just a little bit right across the street. So, you know, we really appreciate that you're here and you open this up. And uh, all the District 5 residents raise their hands. Oh. Yay! Thank you for right here. It's really important. 
to hear you. I mean, we have our priorities, right? It's housing. It's housing. It's housing. It's all kinds of housing. Uh, whether that is new housing, and yes, Mayor Bree, I will be part of that one. Anything for affordable housing. Absolutely. Um, and then also, uh, my, I've been really pushing, and we pushed through the ERAP, and putting $40 million to buy existing buildings. Because it's so much, yeah, yes, I mean, my existing buildings that people are living in to uh, create uh, affordable housing building. That's really a priority for me because it's so much easier to keep a person house than to house them. And so that is going to be a priority and how we're pushing funding and making sure people have a, a we have the ability to buy those buildings before speculators buy them and Ellis Acker building. Very important. Also, having a navigation center in my district is very important. A Tay Navigation Center in the Haight-Ash Ferry. That is a priority on my list. I am looking for that location. Anyone have suggestions? Please come to me. Please come to Jeff. He's right here. Um, uh, so, um, just wanting to say thank you, everyone. We're here to listen, and um, and thank you, Supervisor, for being one of my partners here. Um, and so we're going to open it up. Thanks to the department too for being here. There we go. That's working now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Farley. I'm the director of the Office of Trans Initiatives, and I support our LGBT programs here in the city. And it's such an honor to welcome you here um, with Mayor Freed and the supervisors to really open it up to you all to hear about what questions you have for the city and um, for our mayor. Um, so we have a couple mic runners in the room. We also have um, one in the back, and then we have some overflow room space as well where we're collecting questions. So if you do have a question but you're not able to um, share it with us today, please write that down on the note cards that are available. Um, and the team is going to make sure that we respond um, to all of your questions. Um, because again, as the mayor said, this is really an opportunity for us to hear from you and make sure that we're being guided by the work that's out of the community. So I think we have a question, Alex, there in the back. And please introduce yourself and your affiliation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jojo Tai, and I serve on San Francisco Youth Commission as a District 8 appointee and chair of the Housing Committee. Of the 1,300 youth who are experiencing homelessness in the city, about half of them are LGBTQ. My friends and community face a lot of violence in the streets, shelters, and other community spaces. There was a 2015 goal of 400 units of permanent supportive housing and a teen navigation center. Today, in 2019, we have less than 200 units for youth and no established, established navigation center. Where does the city go from here, and when can we find the proportional funding to bridge this gap and meet the needs of trans and queer youth in the city? Navigation Center, for those of you who may not be familiar with the terminology, transitional age youth, it represents those young people between the ages of 18 and 24. Um, and in the, specifically, we have some locations that we have identified, and until we're able to um, lock those locations down uh, with the property owners, uh, we can't necessarily make that information available to the public, but it's funded. We have to find the location, and we have some options that we're looking into. Um, I am like closing in on it, hopefully, uh, but it is still a challenge, as you know, to try and find locations that we can use for this particular purpose, whether it's for transitional age youth or for adults. Um, just recently, we announced plans for a new uh, shelter that will have a, about 200 beds along the waterfront area, and that is going to be a challenge to get that particular space open, even if it's a temporary uh, space to use. Um, as far as housing and providing supportive housing for transitional age youth, um, one of the projects that I really fought for was the Booker T. Washington Community Center, and I'm so really proud of that work. Um, but unfortunately, we need more, and our Rising Up campaign 
uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is really our goal to make sure that we are raising private dollars, public dollars, to provide support for those transitional age youth uh, for apartments that may not be affordable housing, may be in just the regular market. And so providing subsidies, providing wraparound services for housing and support is something that we are working on. Nothing is more important to me than ensuring the success of young people because I've witnessed you know, just some challenges that have exist, whether it was growing up in poverty or working at the African American Art and Culture Complex and just a real disconnect uh, between opportunity and young people in San Francisco. So we are committed to making the right investments and I do know that we are not moving uh, fast enough, but we are identifying the resources, raising the funds and trying to get it going as quickly as possible. Um, it won't be easy, but our goal is to end youth homelessness in this city. Um, what is our year again? 20, 2022, we can do better than that. <laughs> Hopefully sooner than that, but we are really focused on that particular goal. So thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Um, the tragedy of Tess Rothstein's death is that it was 100% preventable. Had she gotten 30 more yards into that protected bike lane, she would not have died. Um, our streets are grievously dangerous for daily cyclists like me. Um, we've got 900 miles of street parking in the city and county. We have a handful of protected bike lanes. Can you commit to building not just a protected bike lane down the entirety of our Key Barcadero, but a comprehensive citywide protected bike lane network this year? So let me tell you that um, when I first became supervisor, for example, the uh, Fell and Oak Street bike lanes were basically being delayed. And I really pushed hard to get those done ahead of schedule. Um, and since I've been in office, one of the commitments that I have made is to move these projects forward faster. In fact, you probably are familiar with the work that we did to get Valencia going sooner rather than later. Redirecting resources, focusing on the high injury corridors, making the right investments to get San Francisco to a better place where, and, and I want to be clear because I think that there is some confusion around why we push for um, you know, protected bike lanes. It's not because you know, the Bicycle Coalition and its advocacy is for safety is to keep people safe. We are trying to change how our infrastructure works because there was a time where people never biked in San Francisco, hardly ever, and it was built to support cars. The Western Edition was destroyed to create what in essence on Gary Boulevard is a freeway. And so now we have to change behavior. We're almost like going backward and it's like pulling teeth. Um, and so part of what we have to do is make the right investments and be more aggressive about improving these uh, particular um, intersections where we know there are real challenges. One death is a tragedy, especially one that can be avoided. Um, and so part of our responsibility is to, of course, do better. But I will tell you, you know, one of my biggest frustrations oftentimes, um, and I'm not necessarily attributing that to anything other than, you know, bureaucracy, and especially when I'm trying to put forth policies that are going to get rid of things and remove bureaucracy and remove layers that get in the way of how we allocate resources to get these things done, you know, that is something we have to work on. I know the competitive bid process provides for equal opportunity for people to compete, but what happens when a case like this occurs and we need to get a contractor to deal with the situation now? Like, we can't have it both ways. We have to focus on making safety, making public safety the priority, and making the decisions and being more aggressive and moving these decisions forward to change just really what is um, a, a challenge with getting around in the city, whether you're on a bike, whether you, if, if you notice 20 years ago, you didn't see so many people on bicycles using them to commute. You didn't see so many people walking around the streets. We have increased our population. We increased the number of people who are working in San Francisco, which means that we have to increase the abilities for people to use various modes of transportation to get around safely. It's about folks who are walking feeling safe and knowing where they belong, folks who are on bicycles knowing where they belong, 
cars, knowing where they belong, and yes, enforcement is a big part of this because we are not doing enough ground enforcement. Um, with people who I see on a regular basis um, driving in ways that are very dangerous. Um, you know, we see the challenges with bicyclists as well. And so part of it is really trying to make sure we're holding everyone accountable, you know, to respect the rules of the law, but ultimately cars are the most dangerous. And we have to remember that when we are maneuvering our cars all over the streets, we have to be careful about even something as simple as opening our door or, you know, one of the things, there was a law that I heard about where, and I know I don't want to add another law, but the fact is, you know, if you just open your door, for example, in your car with your right hand, it forces you almost to look in the mirror to make sure that you don't open it. And, and, and it could be a car, it could be a scooter, it could be a bicycle, it could be anyone walking past you. We all have to also take some responsibility along with changes to infrastructure to improve you know, public safety for all citizens because you know, this situation that happened is, is heartbreaking. And you're right, it could have been avoided. And that means that the longer we delay, that means the possibility that one more person uh, could be the next victim. And we want to avoid that by any means necessary. So we definitely have work to do. Thank you. And that third question, we also have some questions from the overflow room. We're going to have to you right now. Yes, I do. Um, are you good? Yeah, I want to thank you, Mayor Green, for even having a town hall. And, um, actually, uh, my name is James Spangola. I'm director of the uh, LAOS Community Center. And I actually want to say that I have definitely seen the progress. I am going to put that I am a San Francisco native. Uh, actually a Fillmore District native, uh, born and raised in the Western Division. And I just actually want to say that I have seen the improvement in the homeless and cleaning up uh, around the facility that I actually work at, um, the community center where we actually have a bunch of kids. There we actually run 150 kids through there on a daily, right? But um, what I'm starting to see now is that, you know, even though we're running the, the drug users away, what I'm starting to see now is the mental health part piece of it coming through, right? And I just want to know what's your plan for, you know, kind of control the mental health. I want to thank DPW, SFPD, uh, Supervisor Brown, um, Partner Rec for actually coming around making sure that we're actually getting the needles and all that stuff actually cleaned up. But, you know, then now we're starting to see the things that we can control, and that's the mental health part. So it's harder for us to kind of just go out and have somebody that's not too, you know, not really there to say, hey, can you move and get nothing to do about these things. So I just want to know what's your plan for this kind of the mental health part of it. Yeah, and, and we've been working on some solutions. Um, and, and I got to tell you, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges that we face as a city. But ultimately, we got to look at this the same way that we look at someone who might get physically harmed. When you break an arm or when you have a sickness or what have you, you go to the hospital, the doctor diagnoses the condition, and sometimes there's support and help for it. Um, and in the case of someone suffering from mental illness in various capacities, whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's someone who has psychosis brought on because of their drug use, or someone who has dementia, or all of these different things, we have to spend more time developing the right system of care for that particular population, especially people who may not have support from family members. Um, so I, we are going to be hiring a uh, mental health director who will operate under directly under the Department of Public Health in order to organize the services that we are uh, providing and also enhance those services. In fact, I have made it my mission to provide more mental health stabilization beds, which no one wanted to do, no one wanted to talk about now. Since I've been in office, we've had added 50 new mental health stabilization beds, and we're going to add another 100 this year. <laughs> I've got to say, Supervisor Mandelman has been my partner on our conservatorship law changes. They can't come fast enough. What we're doing right now, sadly, is using our jails and using our hospitals you know, to cycle people in and out of the system, and that is not a, a solution. Uh, to our public health crisis. And so part of what we are doing is working with Senator Scott Weiner. We got one bill passed. It's not sufficient. 
Um, we're going to work with him on some changes to that bill so that it can actually work. Uh, and what that would do is allow us to go through the court system and provide a guardian who can make decisions for someone who unfortunately can't make decisions for themselves. Um, and that is something Senator Weiner is working on through the process. Um, both myself and uh, Supervisor Mandelman have been championed. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, it is one of the most challenging things that we're dealing with right now. But we have to shift the focus around mental health in a way that we never have before. Not just the people that we see on our streets, that we visibly see who need help, but also, in some instances, you know from the children that you work with and the experiences that they have where they're sometimes dealing with trauma. And how are we going to make sure that we provide the kinds of resources both in our schools, in our nonprofit agencies, how do we make sure that we have public health support in a very responsible way to deal with people suffering from depression or suffering from dementia or identifying the signs when a kid is, is struggling in some capacity? Um, so we are just going to transform the conversation. And that's why we need a director to begin to centralize what we do around mental health reform in San Francisco. And this is something that is clearly a top priority. But I want to be honest, unfortunately, that change is not going to happen right away because we don't have all the tools that we need in terms of our laws in order to address some of the most significant challenges. Um, but it doesn't mean that we won't continue to work on this issue uh, to make those changes, to provide the mental health stabilization beds, and to begin the reforms that are necessary and make the right investments to deal with the challenge. Thank you. And you'll have to excuse me, but I'm going to refer to my notes. The San Francisco economy is robust and booming, full steam ahead. However, locally owned businesses in the upper market, Castro area, are struggling and frustrated by the daily social challenges we face. We're struggling with homeless, mentally ill, and drug addicted that roam and live in our merchant corridors. Shoplifting, vandalism, increased trash, and high rents pose significant challenges to shop owners and contribute to our retail vacancy problem. It's become a vicious cycle, uh, pitting shop owners against the homeless and the mentally ill. People don't want to shop where they don't feel safe, and shop owners don't want to run a business that's constantly under siege from vandalism, shoplifting, defecation in doorways, and harassment of staff. These increased risks are forcing retail staff to reevaluate working evening shifts. Additionally, we're frustrated with the limited amount of workforce housing for our staffs. We're frustrated by a planning department that takes 16 months to entitle a new business. This is a new business with zero neighborhood opposition. In fact, all neighborhood groups voted in favor of it, and it still took 16 months to get through the planning department. The many city, uh, the city mandates, requirements, fees, taxes, coupled with high sky or sky high rents and online retail competition all contribute to the empty storefront lining the shopping corridors of this booming city. What happens when the economy softens and retailers face increased challenges? What more can the city do to support small businesses and address the social issues that are soiling our shopping districts? And I, I really appreciate your question because um, most recently um, I had a conversation uh, with Joaquin Torres, who's the Director of Office in Economic and Workforce Development. And one of the things that we most recently did uh, was made it easier to permit um, other use that weren't permitted in small businesses, but that's not far enough. We have to cut the fees. We have to cut city fees, things that we charge small businesses that make it difficult for you to continue to stay in business. Now, I know we don't have any control necessarily over the state taxes that get charged, but we do have control over fees that we charge businesses. I, I, I met with a small business owner who basically told me about the fee for the register and then the fee for this machine and I'm like what uh, you know like layers of fees yeah. and scanner fee really I mean Joaquin yeah. change it <laughs> I, I, for, for me what I'm most worried about and, and it's not just the Castro and the market if you look around every city in every commercial corridor where 
you used to have so many neighborhood thriving businesses, you don't see that anymore. And you don't see that because it's so difficult to do business. And the businesses that you see, the owners are right there working, their family members are struggling to hold it together, and I know we can do better than that. And so part of my directive to uh, Joaquin is to really look at where can we cut the fees? Just like what we are proposing to do with accessory dwelling units. We're saying, okay, we have a surplus in the Department of Building Inspection, we can't use that money for anything else, cut the fees entirely for accessory dwelling units, which will incentivize people to want to build more housing. We gotta do the same thing with small businesses. So, so what I'm committed to is trying to make it easier and trying to find solutions where, you know, it's not just like I don't wanna, I mean legacy businesses are great, providing additional resources to help, you know, subsidize the rent are great, but ultimately how do we cut back on what you have to pay the city? And that's really what I'm focused on to try and make life easier from the financial standpoint. As far as the other quality of life issues, that will continue to be a struggle for us because again, we need more places for people to go. I'm proposing a thousand new shelter beds that we need to get up and running sooner rather than later so that we have places for people to go. When we're offering services, when we're offering support, we need some place to take them. We also need our reforms to our mental health system because as you know, so many of those people that you see are struggling with mental illness. And even if we were able to get them into a shelter bed, that's not a solution for them because they're gonna be right back on the streets in the same location, doing some of the same things that they're doing, which is why we need changes to our conservatorship laws in order to try and move more people off the street. But more importantly, San Francisco can't do this by ourselves. And when I'm out there in the streets talking to people, because I'm always calling Jeff, and I'm like, Jeff, who is this guy? Jeff Kaczynski, who runs the Mayor's Office of Housing and Homeless Services, he usually knows their name or their story or the situation or why we can't get them help or what have you. And then there's all these new people as well who are coming from various situations, who I've talked to and, and tried to get an understanding. So many different reasons why people are choosing to come to San Francisco. But I, I do hear more often is, I heard I can get help here. And you know that is really frustrating because you know we, we help 50 people a week to get housed and, and, and or reconnected with their families through a home bound program, and then we have 65 more people to take their place. And so, but what's frustrating is housing for our staff that's earning between 40 and 60 thousand a year. There is no place for them to live if they go further out onto to Concord or or, or you know Concord Costa County. They're on a very expensive park train. Yes. Then they have to switch over to Muni to get up to the Castro. At least five times a week, I get, I'm sorry, Ed, I get texts from my employees that just say MM. Yeah. That means they're going to be 15 to 45 minutes late. MM stands for Muni Meltdown. So, <laughs> you know, they live in the neighborhood of the walk, but there is no housing for them. There is no place for the people that aren't earning 200,000 a year or zero. Yeah. It seems like that's where our priorities are. There's nothing for people in the, in the middle. And, and I will tell you that we got a building and, and we made some changes to our, our affordable housing requirements and it was very challenging. I mean, I got a lot of pushback because, um, you know, there was a, it was implied that we were not doing enough for really low income people. But in fact, you know, I think we have to change how we provide housing where we, provide housing for low, moderate, and middle income. And so when I'm gonna be working with the Board of Supervisors to put together a ballot measure, and that ballot measure, I'm of course pushing for to pay for different layers of affordability. And what I would also encourage, um, because we do have you know, options, even though those options are very challenging to, to get, um, is to go to the Mayor's Office of Housing website, Make sure that they register. There's alerts that come out like almost every day, once or twice a day, of housing options that vary in terms of who qualifies. And I would encourage you know your employees to apply for everything that they qualify for. But we also got to get rid of the layers that get in the way. It is so difficult to build housing in this city. And as soon as we again come to a particular neighborhood. And I mean, even in the Haight-Ashbury, where we were able to buy the McDonald's site, 
where I'm like, well, let's you know do what's in reason. Let's not, of course, mess with the character, but we can go possibly six or eight stories, and we can provide new affordable housing, but of course there's pushback to say, you know, we shouldn't go this far, but we're gonna have to go that far. Um, we're gonna have to do that. <laughs> sure District 5 residents know that at the Fillmore Heritage Center, which is on Fillmore, they, uh, San Francisco Housing Development Corporation is in there. It's a community hub. They also have housing workshops, credit workshops, all these different workshops to get ready people ready to apply and uh, for affordable housing. So in all, both of our districts, we have these uh, resources for you. Great, so we're gonna go back to Alex for the next question. I'm Mayor Soups and Reps, thanks for being here. So my first question is real quick. The LGBTQ cultural heritage strategy, a plan to preserve and promote LGBTQ culture in San Francisco is moving through the planning department. It was started by Supervisor Scott Wiener, and this is my first of two questions. Who in City Hall will be our champion to move this past the finish line? Who will be our Joaquin? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping it would be Rap and, and our mayor, but that means I'm coming to you. I'm going to make it'll Joaquin be, do everything. Don't I'm worry, not. you guys have to go do it. It'll be, a, it'll, it'll be a combination of partnership with our office, mayor's office of housing, and the planning department to move that ever forward. But well, we need a point, one point person, so, okay, thank you. Thanks. My, my question is um, more so that the cultural districts are a great way to embed culture into our neighborhoods and they have the potential to actually gentrify the neighborhoods, how will you ensure that the cultural districts don't stimulate gentrification and instead demand more than cash incentives for modest, affordable housing from developers? So I, I think part of some of the projects that we've been able to do in San Francisco has been um, you know, community benefits that help stabilize some existing long-term nonprofit agencies that serve the community. I know that in one particular case, there was um, community benefits that helped uh, to purchase and keep a building through a small size acquisition program um, to help purchase and keep that building affordable because it was on the market and those folks possibly were facing, you know, unfortunately, who knows what as a result of a new owner of that particular building and now it's a completely 100% affordable building. And so I think there are creative ways when 
um, looking at developers and their uh, responsibilities to the communities that they are uh, developing in to provide not only housing, uh, affordable housing on their sites, which you know is always something I really uh, love to do, and not to mention I help get neighborhood preference legislation passed so that 40% of all those units go to the people who actually live in that district first, which I think is one way to make sure that folks in the neighborhood have access to those units, but also having a number of investments, whether it's you know low rents for a particular commercial space or free space for nonprofit agencies that already are there that serve that purpose. Um, so there are just various ways in which we can do that. But I will tell you again, it's 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 it takes a long time to get to those final agreements because. Um, Sometimes people have differences of opinion as to where the investments should go. Um, so we end up fighting, and then we hash it out, and then we come to an agreement, and that takes a little time. But um, there are just various ways to, to do that for sure. But um, you know, as someone who lived through uh, what happened in the Western Edition, um, I'm very sensitive to how um, we change neighborhoods, but also provide opportunities, you know, for existing community. And that's why I fought so hard for neighborhood preference because. I think that's one tool in which we can ensure that folks from the community have a real chance of accessing what becomes newly available in the neighborhood. Mayor um, and actually I was your aide when we fought for neighborhood preference, but um, we, I just had a hearing, we just had a hearing at GAO, Government Audit and Oversight, about neighborhood preference, and it's actually working. And so many people in all areas of the city, all of the uh, districts of the city, have been getting um, housing near where they live. And I think that's really important. So to do, you know, when you do legislation, you never know if it's going to work. But what, four, three years, four years later, uh, the proof is in the pudding. It's actually working. So thank you. And I, I would just add, um, you know, the success of, of open house uh, in providing LGBT senior or LGBT affirming and friendly senior housing um, has been uh, highly reliant on the neighborhood preference. Um, so that's another area where it's been helpful. I do want to also, um, you, you mentioned area uh, places where folks in the district five can get help with um, uh, with accessing some of the housing programs and the LGBT center also does that. So for folks who are, who are looking to tap in and get and think about how they might be able to qualify for a, for a home buyer, program or also or to get into rental housing um, the center is a great resource for that as well and i just also want to add um, you don't just have to have uh, questions you can also have comments <laughs> or suggestions or things that you think we should be doing like um, based on you know your personal experiences uh, i'm peter warfield uh, from the library users association and it isn't just a matter of libraries, oh, there he goes again. But there are a lot of things that are going on in the libraries that are not good for the public, either through their expressed or even not expressed interests. And I'd like to just point out three, some of which have a real decision point coming up. One is radio frequency identification technology, which is coming to the library. It was funded in July. Uh, it's very privacy threatening. The American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California and the Electronic Frontier Foundation have both strongly opposed the installation of this at the library. Uh, number two, the library every five years under the uh, Proposition D that is made it very wealthy, considers ours. And for the second time in a row, the library once again is cutting the very hours that people tell the library through surveys they want the most. And that's evenings and weekends, particularly evenings. The library this time around has just cut 15 evening hours from 10 different libraries. For example, Sunset, which had three nights a week closing at 9, is closing at 8, three nights a week. And that also affects programming. Uh, the third item is fines and fees, which I know you've recently uh, expressed something about. The library, as we know, fines and fees that are fixed in price are not the aggressive tax they hurt the poorest people the most. And so what the library has done recently is to put out a report giving all the reasons why fines are bad and wrong and counterproductive. 
by only focusing on fines and not what we've been talking about for years in other places too, fines and fees. The legislation that they're proposing only proposes to get rid of fines into the future and not touch or even consider the fines that are on the books, which currently people owe $600,000 in fines. Great. And not to consider fees at all, for example, replacement books, and that's four times as much. So we'd like to know, we'd like the legislation to include all the fines as well as fees, and you have a chance also when it shortly is coming up for you to choose a new city library to keep all of these bad things in mind and what will the new librarian that you will select, how will we decide on a new one? We're supposed to get three names of a library. Great, right. thank you. Thank you, Peter. So first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate having a woman as a mayor and her approach of community because I think that, that speaks to what women do very well is uh, consensus and trying to bring everyone together. Um, I'm going to be anonymous and I'm going to talk about a topic you don't hear much about and I'm here to raise an issue. Family court is broken. <coughs> Single mothers are going broke and homeless, fighting the injustices that are happening in SF family court. Currently is a battle of who has the most money. Is who wins the kids, who wins the property, and this is just fundamentally wrong. Today I was helping a mother and I received a quote for $600 for a mother to see her child for three hours. This mother hasn't seen her children in six weeks. That's $200 an hour. How much do you have to make to be able to afford that? I would like to ask the city of San Francisco to create a channel where the injustices of San Francisco family court can be addressed and an unbiased family court can be created. There needs to be a method to communicate and request that factual information is used instead of bias. So my questions are specifically, what area of city government is going to work on changing that? And I appreciate the gentleman over there to ask for who is going to be our champion in San Francisco, in the government, so to, to help represent the underrepresented so that we can have factual information as opposed to judges' and custody evaluators that present bias information. Thank you for your question. And I'm not as familiar with the details of, of what you're referring to, but um, I will make sure that we get back to you with the right person um, to address this particular issue. Um, do you know what department that falls under, the Department of? Children, Youth and Services, or uh, Family uh, Welfare. Oh. Okay, so we, it, we have a number of different city departments, and I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar. We have uh, Child Protective Services, which I believe the social workers who exist in that department may be responsible for this particular issue, but may not be doing it in a way that, I mean, to be charged to see your kid is just something that's really sad and unfortunate, and I, I would hope um, that we can make some changes to what is clearly an inequitable system that is not affordable to people who, who may not have money to facilitate a process like this. So um, I apologize, but um, we will definitely, and I know you want to remain anonymous, and we're happy to figure out a way in which we could uh, coordinate information to get back to you on a real solution to try and address that particular problem. And, and thank you for bringing it to our attention. And please feel free to uh, either talk with myself or Kira, who gave you the mic, and we'll talk. Got one there, one so here. One question here in the back with Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer, and I've got kids in the public school system. And I'm curious what the city is doing to support our public school teachers here in San Francisco. I know you mentioned sometimes there's disagreements about how funds should be spent. I know that that's been a recent disagreement. So I'm just curious what your plans are to keep our kids in good schools? Well, I um, went to public schools in San Francisco and I really am committed to working with our superintendent um, to address what I know are serious inequities in terms of providing services to some of our underperforming schools, which continues to be a bit of tension um, that exists between, you know, what I believe is my office and, and, and the school district and the challenges with making sure that all of our kids are provided with 
um, support and resources, especially in what we know are sadly some of the um, most, the, the largest number of underperforming schools, which sadly are in the Baby Hunters Point, southeast sector of the city. Um, so my commitment is to continue to work with the school district um, to try and find creative solutions, uh, including bonuses or incentives or support um, you know, to try and get the kind of resources and stability with the teachers in that particular, those particular areas because retention continues to be a problem. Um, but there are other issues that come into play that, you know, the school, the teachers union, there, there's a bit of a challenge in terms of how, um, you know, they, they feel about, you know, equity in terms of what their teachers get paid, but um, there's, there's just, you know, there's seniority, there's other issues, but our lowest performing schools need a lot more attention and a lot more resources. Um, separately from that, um, the city provides over $100 million in funding to the school district um, because of the generous support of the voters of the city. Um, there's the Department of Children, Youth, and Families where there's additional resources for other programs. And I mean, the list goes on and on. I think the problem is uh, the efforts aren't as coordinated as they should be. Um, to really make sure that the resources that are provided are being used in a more efficient way um, to really make the kind of difference that we need. But my commitment is to the kids and to seeing that achievement gap close. And I think that everyone should be at the table and willing to sacrifice in order to do that. And that's what I'm going to be pushing for. Uh, and I'm just curious, is San Francisco looking at any of the teacher housing programs that some other cities have taken on? We, we are, and in fact, there's an area where we don't have funding <laughs> that we need the support, and, and hopefully we can get gap funding with potentially this housing bond that we're looking at for where Playland is and, and the uh, Sunset. Is it the Sunset or the Richmond? Sunset? Okay. It's, it's in the um, west side of the city where there's 100% um, affordable teacher housing, and I know that the school district is making decisions around their properties as well um, for the purposes of providing housing for, for their teachers. And I know that today, because I met with the superintendent, to talk about ways in which we can you know, support our educators and get them to apply for our existing affordable housing and our down payment assistance program. Um, you know, there is support that is provided, but it's just not enough because it's so expensive to live in San Francisco. So it, it, it continues to be a challenge, but it's something that we're trying to have a real partnership. What it, what I, I want to make sure that, you know, there's not a, there's a real partnership in our efforts and not the city being told what to do. It's like we need to work together if we want to address these issues, and, and that's really what I'm focused on. And again, the achievement gap, which has existed you know, since before I was born and has not been addressed and not been the target of focus um, like it should, and, and it's something that we need to make sure we invest in. Oh, I just want to say a few words about that because even though <clears throat> in the ERAP money we gave the teachers raises, it's not enough to live here because housing is too expensive. And so I think teacher housing is, is what is going to keep teachers here. If a teacher has to drive um, outside the city, back and forth, eventually they will be. And um, I think that we, uh, Mayor Breed hit on the point, and we've been talking about this at the board and pushing the school district to look at their land for teacher housing. And we've done a lot of private public development in this city, like the port, and uh, where we can build private public land for the teachers. Um, but it means that the district will have to step up and look at the land that they have to be able to use this for teacher housing. I don't see it happening any other way of keeping teachers here with the raise they got, with, with the kind of cost that the housing is right now. So this is something we really need to have the school district step up, and I think all of us are in support of that. I would just, if I could add, one of the things that was sad and frustrating to me about the ERAP conversation was I think it left a lot of um, particularly public school parents feeling like schools aren't valued in San Francisco and that the city government doesn't value schools enough. And I just want to say that that I think is really not true and that I think actually in terms of what San Francisco, um, the commitment that our vote, as, as Mayor Bree said, that, there, that our voters have made, that we use $100 million of general fund money each year um, to, to go over and support all the things um, that have been lost since Prop 13 passed um, in the public schools. And that is a commitment that no other county 
in California makes. And so that's significant. And then what we did around ERAP, where we actually went further and said we're going to use these general fund dollars actually to support raises for teacher salaries. And again, it's not enough. But that is an unprecedented commitment, which I'm proud of, and I know the mayor is proud of. Um, we need to do more, but really it's very, very hard in the state where funding for schools is um, so bad statewide. And where we've gone from, you know, when I was born, being one of the states that spent the most on per pupil spending to being one of the one of the states that spends the least. And so that's, you know, a statewide conversation around Prop 13. But I think San Franciscans, we always have to push for more. But we really ought to be proud about what our what our city does for our public schools. Wonderful. So we only have time for a couple more questions, but I want to let folks know. You know, we could be here all night there, um, but we will have department heads. Uh, sticking around for a little bit afterwards. So, for should we introduce the department heads quickly here? Um, yeah, we can do that. So why don't we take the last two questions and then we'll introduce. Um, so, uh, here we have one question in the back. Yeah. Are you ready? Hi, I'm uh, Mayor Green. Uh, my name is David. I'm part of, uh, I'm a student of the UCSF UC Hastings uh, Health Policy and Law Masters and also part of the SFDPH um, as a healthcare worker. Um, over years of medical coursework, public health work, and health policy experience became uh, indubitably evident to me that housing, uh, security, and health uh, health status are intimately tied. Um, I live in the Mission, about a block from the 1979 Mission Street project that they're proposing. Um, so my question is, uh, what is your take on this project? And if uh, this project was greenlighted, how, how will you ensure uh, that this project would not simply drive out existing homeless individuals uh, from the 16th Street Mission Park area. Uh, it would not, uh, how would you make it so that it would not gentrify this neighborhood? And how would you preserve the rich and unique history of the Mission District? Um, are we talking about the project on the Mission in uh, 16th? Yeah, the, the one that's with the Walgreens. Yeah, and, and so here's a, the sad reality. I mean, that um, uh, particular project along with a number of other um, projects that have been built in the mission has already moved the mission uh, neighborhood in a direction that has really changed it. Um, I hardly, as someone who was born and raised here, I hardly, um, you know, recognize um, the neighborhood anymore. And I think part of it is um, we have to do better uh, with our investments in, number one, affordable housing, number two, small site acquisition. So that is, again, protecting people who are in buildings where most of the individuals um, are potentially low income individuals who need long term protection, and also holding developers accountable to do more in a neighborhood that's been rapidly gentrified. Um, so it's something that uh, continues to be a challenge. The folks in the mission community supported my efforts around neighborhood preference because even though they had been advocating for affordable housing, and in some instances we were able to get some of those projects built a long time ago, they weren't still getting access to them. So neighborhood preference plays a critical role, but we haven't been building enough affordable housing in this particular community. And part of the recent support um, through the Board of Supervisors for the windfall, the ERAP funding that we keep talking about, um, some of those funds are going to be used, hopefully, uh, to purchase uh, properties that are available in the Mission District in particular uh, for the purposes of 100% affordable housing. So um, there are a number of things, and, and, and since I've been in office, we've broken ground on two new 100% affordable housing projects that are coming um, coming up and going to be built, and 40% of those units will go to the folks in that neighborhood. And so I think, really, it's going to be about investments. It's going to be about, um, and I'm not saying the housing bond is going to solve everything, but a number of uh, folks from the mission in particular who have been fighting for housing are going to be at the table and helping to make decisions around uh, how dollars get allocated, but we have to invest more, um, ultimately, and we have to do more outreach and more support, um, and also, of course, really hold developers accountable in this particular neighborhood more so than ever because of how rapidly um, things have changed, and, and I'm definitely committed to that. Great, so our next question comes from Alex in the back. And just to highlight to folks, Alex and his team are also working to do neighborhood sessions <coughs> with the mayor, so that information will be available on the mayor's site. Also, we'll be doing monthly uh, town calls. The next one is on May 6th at UCSF and Mission Bay. Alex, your question. 
Thank you, Mary, for taking my last question here. My name is Shelly. Um, I'm with the Surfrider Foundation, and I lead a program within Surfrider called Hold On To Your Butt. And we're all about getting rid of cigarette litter in the city. Uh, I wanted to thank you, first of all, because I know you've supported um, efforts to actually have policy legislation to ban cigarette filters in the past. And we would love to talk to you more about that now that you are mayor. <laughs> in addition, sadly, even though the cigarette litter fee has been in place since 2009, a study five years after showed that the overall percentage of cigarette litter actually increased. So I'd also love to talk with you about much more effective ways that we can make use of the millions of dollars that come in from that fee specifically to abate cigarette litter every year. Um, specifically through education and infrastructure and something um, that can actually extend citywide to really stop this toxic plastic litter from entering our waterways. So thank you. Thank you. So we have one question from the overflow room. Um, this will be our last question. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion for years about finding uh, oh, are we reading another question? safe injection sites are on um, as an effective way to reduce HIV and AIDS infection rates. Uh, where is the city at on the implementation of safe injection sites? <laughs> <laughs> really determined to, to make this happen because, um, you know, I think what I want people to understand why, you know, I'm advocating for this is because, you know, people who unfortunately struggle with substance use disorder, they're not just going to go away because we don't want to see it. And we have to get creative around solutions to try and help people get into treatment. Um, this is about, yes, getting the needles off the streets. Yes, getting people who are shooting up off the streets. But more importantly, we have to meet people where they are, especially when they're asking for help. Um, you know, sadly, I have a lot of experience dealing with people in my family um, and friends who suffer from substance use disorder. And it is heartbreaking. Um, there are a number of things that, um, you know, prevent people from, you know, seeking help. And, and one of them is just access. <coughs> and part of what a safe injection site provides is access um, to the possibility when someone is treated with respect um, and not judged, and most likely when they're ready to get help, they're gonna go to those same people who are in that site who they see probably every single day. And, and it really is about, for me, making sure there are real places for treatment on demand. And so I'm committed to <laughs> I'm really committed to making this happen. And I know Dr. Colfax, um, who is our new director of the Department of Public Health, is also equally committed to this work. Uh, State Senator Scott Weiner reintroduced his bill that was vetoed by former Governor Jerry Brown in hopes that our new governor, Gavin Newsom, will support it. Um, that's just one hurdle um, that I think will help us um, feel a lot more empowered um, to, to do a safe injection site, even though there are serious um, federal challenges um, that we are definitely very concerned about. But um, I think that it's important that we move forward, and I'm committed to moving forward. I also have to, unfortunately, um, you know, if, if I thought, you know, uh, it wouldn't be as challenging as the whole moving forward with marijuana thing, um, where people, you know, potentially face the possibility of getting arrested. Um, in this particular case, you know, you know, we're concerned about taking away people's federal money and getting arrested and a couple of other things. But it, it, it's definitely something I'm seriously, um, I'm seriously going to push for. I'm not going to uh, drop it, drop the ball. And I think that uh, we need two important things to happen. Number one, we need to pressure Gavin. Don't tell him I told you that. But we need to. We still need money for housing. <laughs> number two, we need to elect a new president. Um, <laughs> the fact is, you know, we are we are under threat on a regular basis with all of the progressive policies and values that we continue to try to push in order to 
you know, change our city, which in essence changes our country for the better. So I'm hoping to continue to move in that direction and, and get it done. Thank you, Mayor. between uh, justice and the LGBT community and how especially transgender people are seen in this community. And one of the most unfortunate things that I've experienced since I've been here for four years moving from Texas was to find that law enforcement, uh, people who I'm supposed to be able to trust, uh, SFPD and the sheriff, uh, have been uh, across the line a line of responsibility and dignity that each human being should be encountered and they don't have the training, they don't have the funds, they don't have the correct, the department is so divided between all the departments and how they see and how they react to, especially people that are, that are LGBT and have a mental illness. They don't know how to respond properly and there are so many people that are end up being in jail that shouldn't be in jail or so many women who don't have justice, they can't get justice because someone covers it up or someone doesn't want to talk about it, even though it's very difficult to talk about hate crimes that happen in our own city, our own progressive city, where that's not supposed to happen, but it does. That's why I've been wearing this cape this whole entire time, because I'm a victim of a hate crime, and it didn't seem like anyone was paying attention, because I'm not the only woman who's been hurt by the system. I got attacked by a security guard. And then I didn't have police to back me up to try and get my attacker. And I'm not the only one. And so I want to know what you will do with the Board of Supervisors to ensure that the LGBT community and law enforcement and, and other citizens get reconnected and, and have a real conversation about how to have justice for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Part of um, what's important um, is to build a relationship. And what we did when uh, Supervisor Brown and I uh, worked together for so many years um, in the Western Edition community when we were dealing with a lot of crime and also um, a lot of distrust with the police department, uh, we started to come together and have conversations and started to work together. And there was a consistent relationship that was built over time. And I think that part of what I want to see happen for the rest of the city, because we know that there are challenges that exist with law enforcement and so many folks in various communities, especially you know, our low income communities, we have to start to build that bridge. And that takes developing a relationship. That takes making sure there's community engagement where you're not just seeing officers when there's a, a problem, but the officers are there on a regular basis just to say hello, and that's what occurred. And I gotta tell you, the first couple of years, years, not days, years, you know, the boys in the African American art culture complex, they throw stuff at the police, they curse the police out. I mean, it was really challenging. Um, it was a, a really uh, tense, you know, relationship because we would still ask them to come and we wanted them there and we wanted to have the hard conversations and they had the hard conversations. They let the boys make the comments and say what they needed to say to say, we don't trust you and why are you trying to, you know, like, we gotta have those hard conversations. But after a while, you know, first it was like they wouldn't speak to the officers. As time went by, little head nod. As time went by, little fist bump. And now so many of those kids are adults and have these incredible relationships with some officers who are not, you know, they're kind of all over the city. They're not still all in the district. Some of them still are. But, you know, they're like, oh, that's, you know, you know who the kid is. You're like, hey, how you doing? Like that kind of relationship, that kind of rapport. And so we have to do that with our entire police department throughout our city. We have to build better relationships. And our officers have to be out there walking the beats, getting to know our communities, and not just when there are challenging times. 
And I gotta tell you, the, the people who get the text messages from me the most um, are definitely our police chief. Um, uh, where are the officers? What's going on over here? Who have they been talking to? What's happening? I wanna see beat officers when I'm out in the community. I spend days just kind of randomly in the skies, walking around neighborhoods. <laughs> I put on a little disguise, I'm not gonna tell you guys what it is. But I just, want, I just wanna see, while I'm going and I'm walking and hanging out, I wanna see if what I see. I wanna see if there's a lot of dirt somewhere, or you know, if there are officers walking, or what's going on with beauty, what, what's going on with you know, people who are struggling with homelessness. And so part of it is, you know, these are the folks who are helping to lead the city. And so they have a responsibility to work to make life better for each and every one of you. And that is something, especially with law enforcement, um, that I'm definitely committed to. And we're going to keep working on that. Um, and we're happy to even begin the conversation where we have a conversation with our officers, with our chief, with Claire moderating in our trans community to really have the discussion around how do we build a better bridge so that people feel you know, safe in their communities and, and feel that they are also gonna be protected too. And I, I'm definitely committed to that. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, so now um, I'd like to turn it over to our department heads to introduce themselves um, for HSH, which is the Housing and Homeless Services Police Department. They're going to be in the red room, which is 201, just out this door. Um, and then MTA Public Works is going to be in the blue room, which is going to be their own rooms. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be around the corner. Um, and then myself, Park and Rec, OAWD, um, and the supervisors will, will be in this room. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. And then we have, where's Katie? Hardly from the Office of Housing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you'll be in here with us. Sorry, my list wasn't. Um, so yeah, let's so, turn it over to So also, can I add before we turn it over? First of all, I just want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Um, you know, I know that some of you may have other questions or concerns and, and may not have had an opportunity to get your questions asked, or you may not feel comfortable talking in front of an audience, and that's totally okay. Um, so if you could reach out to my office um, um, and I'll give you, what is my email address? Mayor London Reed at sfgov.org. And we're writing it up here. Mayor London, <laughs> hey, I didn't know that. <laughs> it was london.reed at sfgov, you remember that? So it's Mayor London Reed, cool. <laughs> uh, so that's my, that's my email address. And is there also a phone number? Yes, my phone number is 415-554-5977. And so that's the email and phone number, but also if you ever have questions or concerns and you don't know who to call, you can you can try and call 311, but also we have an office of neighborhood services. Um, and sometimes you just want to talk to somebody directly. And so that office, Alex, is located in what, what room in City Hall? First floor, room 160, the Van Ness side. Yes, and then last but not least, along with town hall meetings, um, we're going to be hosting some community office hours, so I'm trying to get out of City Hall and, and bring it to the community um, for the purposes of just really um, engaging in conversations. But also, I want to also see, you know, what you're experiencing so that I can make sure that they all know what you're experiencing. And so the reaction I'm hoping um, will be a lot better and we will hopefully get to a place where people are really excited and happy about the changes that we've been able to make. So thank you all so much for being here tonight.
So I voted for you. 